FNAF is known for many things, with some of those things being its jump scares, characters, lore, and atmosphere. But FNAF pioneered the mascot horror genre and made it become what it is today, and with its influence, many people decided to make their own headcanons and stories related to the franchise. Now, I am sure I don't need to explain what an iceberg is along with what a creepypasta is, but before we take a look into this iceberg, I do need to explain how it's ranked. The most popular slash scary and best written stories are at the top, and as we go down, they become more obscure worse written and less scary with the exception of a few good hidden gems so with that being said make sure to subscribe if you love finance at freddy's and let's get into the fnaf creepypasta iceberg The Hidden Lore series is by far one of the most popular FNAF creepypasta series ever made. The series follows many different stories that take place within the confines of the FNAF franchise. Each story is narrated as its own separate entry in the series, with the most popular and iconic one being the first episode, simply titled Hidden Lore. This story has an unreal sense of realism and uniqueness due to the way the stories are portrayed, with it not actually being a written story, but instead a set of YouTube videos with audio narration. Episode 1 starts off with with Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica greeting the restaurant patrons, thanking them for being there, and asking them if they're enjoying their pizza. During this opening dialogue, there can be heard audible cries for help from the animatronics in a glitchy voice, but no one seems to notice. Shortly after this conversation ends between the animatronics, they begin to play music together. But as they start, the power seems to go out. The scene then transitions over the pirate's cove, with Foxy talking to the nearby children, and during his dialogue, we can hear the same audible glitches and cries for help, like how we could with the other animatronics. As Foxy continues to talk to the nearby children, a mom and her daughter walk over the Pirate's Cove, and the daughter is eager to play with Foxy, so she hops on the Pirate's Cove stage and starts touching him. A employee rushes over, begging her to get off of Foxy, but the little girl refuses. As the employee tells her mom to tell her daughter to get off of Foxy, disaster strikes, and all we can hear is a sound of a large crunch with a subsequent sound of blood splattering on the floor. As screams fill the building, the lifeless corpse is left stuck in Foxy's mouth. This the story then fast forwards into the not so distant future, where a familiar phone ring can be heard. We can hear someone pick up the phone, and as they answer, they ask, um, hello? The phone call continues, with the manager of the restaurant and the night guard talking about the incident that just occurred with Foxy. The manager mentions that the animatronics may be acting weird this night, due to the engineers having to change some software because of the bite incident, and the night guard acknowledges this. As the conversation concludes, the night guard begins his night shift, but after some time, he begins to notice weird noises coming from inside the restaurant. As he leaves his office to go and investigate, he realizes that the noises are coming from the animatronics. As he approaches them, they begin talking like how they were on the stage with the occasional glitches crying for help. As the guard begins to notice the strange glitching, he runs back into his office and tries to close the door, but it doesn't shut. As a last ditch effort, he tries to call his boss for help, but the power goes off and Freddy begins to sing his famous jingle. And that's where episode one ends. Now, even though there is plenty more episodes in this series, I'd recommend you check them out on your own for the full experience, as each character is individually voiced by someone unique, and it really elevates the storytelling in a way I haven't really heard. Plus, almost every FNAF game has its own episode, and there is a full one hour long video of all the episodes combined on Mr. Creepypasta's channel. My Summer Job is a creepypasta about a college student, Mike Schmidt, looking for a job to have during his last summer in his hometown. The story begins with the protagonist looking for a job in the local newspaper to pay the bills, when he stumbles upon an ad for one of his favorite childhood pizzerias, Freddy Fazbear's. He calls to see what position is available and if it was still available, which it was. But as Mike looks closer, he realizes that they are only looking for a night guard. Mike was hesitant at first, but reluctantly agreed to the position, mainly because he loved to play so much as a child. After giving the person his information, they told Mike that he could start this fall, which was odd because that was months away. Regardless of this, he decided to accept the position anyways. With enough money to last for the next couple of months, he realized he would be just fine as time passed. And as time did pass, it finally turned November, which meant his first shift for Freddy Fazbear's was right around the corner. Then the day finally came, his first shift. Mike headed to Freddy's, and as he arrived, he began to approach the building, but as he did, he came 
came face to face with the man, which turned out to be the owner. Mike and the owner had a quick conversation, which the owner gave him some advice for the job and the keys to the doors. As Mike thanked him, he entered the building and he began immediately reminiscing about his childhood as a flood of nostalgia hit him. He explored the building for a bit until he began walking to his office, and as he approached the office, the sound of beeping grew louder, and as he finally entered, he realized it was a message machine. As he pressed the play button, he noticed that someone left a message for him about what to do as a night guard. And as the story continues, as nights pass, Mike begins to uncover various secrets about his once beloved pizzeria, with the main thing being that the animatronics are trying to kill him as the nights progress. On night 5 though, after Mike went through pure torture trying to survive against the animatronics throughout the first 4 nights, his boss was waiting for him outside. As Mike approached the building for his 5th shift, he greeted his boss and he was met with an insult from him. His boss confronted him about the previous night guard which was now deceased. Mike admitted to his boss that he didn't know anything about the previous night guard and that he never met him, but the boss continued to interrogate him on the situation. The night prior, which was the 4th night, Mike got a very strange call that ended in a panic from the phone guy, with it abruptly cutting out with a loud scream. Mike knew the previous night guard was dead, but didn't want to believe it. As his boss continued to exclaim that he knew Mike wasn't innocent, his boss explained that there was no forced entry into the building and that all the evidence was pointing to Mike. His boss then left the pizzeria furiously. After this conversation, Mike wondered to himself if he should even finish the night, but he needed the money badly. So as Mike pondered for a moment, he hesitantly entered the building and started his shift. As Mike began his shift, he realized that the animatronics were more aggressive than the previous nights, and as the night continued, the animatronics began to act differently. They were making demonic noises, and on one of the cameras, he could see a Freddy Fazbear suit that was limp. As he looked closer for further inspection, he realized that there were eyeballs poking out of the face, and that dried blood was seeping from the eyes. After seeing this, Mike blacked out, but shortly was awoken by loud banging on the door. Immediately checking the time and cameras, he realized it was 5.55 and that the animatronics were in its respective locations. So Mike started to think that his boss was at the door, so he proceeded to open it, and when he did, the same stuffed Freddy Fazbear suit was waiting outside. He immediately ran out of the building and drove away as fast as he could, planning to never go back. The story then continues two days later, as Mike received a check and notice saying he was fired. Last Call is a very simple creepypasta, basically just a different iteration of the FNAF 1 phone calls, with this story providing more information regarding Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and the phone guy. The story begins at the start of the phone call, with phone guy going on a rant about the company as a whole, while also explaining why he took the job and the reason you were hired. As he is explaining everything, he shifts the conversation over to the animatronics and begins to talk about why the animatronics move at night. Phone guy explains that they are allowed to move at night so their servos wouldn't lock up, and when they weren't allowed to walk at night, the animatronics would begin to twitch and move in unreal ways from their servos malfunctioning. He talks about a time where one of the maintenance workers was trying to fix the animatronics because their necks were broken from the constant twitching they endured every night because of their locked servos. Phone guy explains that as the technician was fixing them, the technician almost lost one of their fingers because the animatronic twitched again. After this incident, they decided to let them roam at night, mainly to avoid any more accidents or malfunctions in their systems, which seemed to work. But one night after this feature was implemented, the morning staff stumbled upon the corpse of one of the previous night guards stuffed inside of a suit in the office. The story then ends with phone guy explaining to the night guard that he set up an ad in the paper for a replacement night guard, and begins to explain that the new night guard fell for his trap and he apologizes about what you are going to go through since you have taken the position. This story is arguably one of my favorites on this list, primarily because of the characters in this story, but due to it being over an hour long, and for fear of me missing too many details, I'm just going to shortly summarize it for you. This creepypasta follows a story of a man looking for a job, and as he searches for one, he stumbles upon a night guard position at Freddy Fazbear's. He quickly takes interest, as Freddy's was a place he would go to a lot as a kid, and also his dad worked there, so he had fond memories of the place. After applying, he goes in for an interview and gets a immediately hired, mainly because the owner knew his father from the time when he had worked there. So the manager finishes up the application process, and that's when the narrator began checking out the place to get a feel for what it would be like to work there. And as he was exploring the restaurant, he realized that one of his favorite animatronics, Foxy, was out of order. The narrator then goes to ask the manager how long Foxy has been broken for, and the manager says it's been more than 10 years. The narrator looks at the manager in shock, as he can't believe how long Foxy has been out of order for. He then asks the manager if he could 
could fix Foxy up, with the manager reluctantly agreeing. The narrator immediately began to start fixing him up as he did have some experience with engineering. Throughout the week as a night guard, he begins to notice that the animatronics move throughout the night and during one of those nights, Foxy saves him from another animatronic attacking him. As Foxy takes him back to Pirate's Cove to hide him from the other animatronics, the two begin to talk about the night guard's childhood and Foxy thanks him for fixing him up. As the story reaches its climax, the night guard is being attacked by all of the animatronics when suddenly another backup Foxy attacks the night guard. This other Foxy was made to be used as a backup but never was. So in retaliation, due to Foxy being so friendly with the night guard, the backup Foxy attacks the night guard brutally which causes him to bleed out and die. Now this is a very short summarization of the story but it's such an amazing story and you really just have to go listen to the full thing because I really can't do it justice here. There is so much more little details and plot elements that really make the build up to this climax so much better that I just couldn't explain. So I know it might not have sounded the best because of the summarization, but the full story is amazing. Four Nights at Freddy's is one of the longest creepypastas on this list. The story is about a guy who desperately needed money, and while searching for a job, he saw that a new pizzeria was opening up near him. So he decided to take this opportunity to apply for a job there. The narrator explains that he would have never have taken the job if it wasn't for the fact that he would be moved over to the day shift after his first five nights. Even though he was hesitant, he explained that he had no choice but to take the job and just decide to get it over with. He got hired almost instantly and was asked to start his for a shift as soon as possible. So with this news, he arrived at the pizzeria a bit later for his first shift, and as he entered, he admired how new and polished everything looked. As he explored the building, he headed towards the office, and as he approached it, he described the office being the strangest office he's ever seen, describing it with one open big door and two vents on each side of the room. As he sat down, he saw a note giving him a quick rundown of what to do, so he read it and then proceeded to start his shift. As the first night continued, he read a newspaper, wound the music box, and occasionally checked the cameras until he heard the sound of heavy footsteps. Looking for an intruder, he checked the cameras but couldn't see anything, but instead noticed that Bonnie was missing. Quickly closing the camera, he turns on the flashlight to see nothing down the hallway until more footsteps were heard. As he turns on the flashlight again, he sees Bonnie standing down the hallway. The narrator found it amusing and was impressed by the technology, but by that time his shift was almost up and he wasn't worried about it. Plus, the note prepared him for this, with it explaining that the animatronics were allowed to move at night, so he didn't really care. But night two was different though. He settled into his same routine, but within a couple of hours, he noticed that the animatronics were acting different. After checking the rest of the rooms on the cameras that he didn't look at the night prior, he realized that Bonnie and Chica were missing from their stage. Checking the cameras more thoroughly, he notices that Bonnie was staring directly into one of the cameras. The narrator was panicked by this, and he became paranoid for the rest of the night, consistently checking the cameras and listening for footsteps. But as some time passed, he did hear footsteps again, and immediately checked the hallway with his flashlight. He could see that it was Chica that time and not Bonnie but that's when the flashlight began to flicker and during this Chica vanished. After this occurred, he was too distracted by it and realized he forgot to wind the music box. He then quickly wound the music box, and then as some more time passed, he heard more footsteps again. So expecting the same thing, he turned on the flashlight and he saw Foxy in the hallway. But Foxy stopped right in his tracks before he proceeded to run back down the hallway. The night guard found this weird, but it hit 6am so he didn't care. Night 3 began normally, with the first hour being relatively calm. So due to it being so relaxed, the night guard decided to go use the bathroom quickly before he continued his shift. After he entered the bathroom and one of its subsequent stalls, he proceeded to use the bathroom. But then shortly after, he started to hear a noise that sounded a lot like the bathroom door being opened. But then he heard those same footsteps again, which confirmed his suspicion that it was one of the animatronics. But then an eerie childlike moan could be heard right after these footsteps, followed by a loud bang of one of the stall doors being forcibly opened. As every stall door was kicked open, the night guard ducked onto the floor to avoid detection from the animatronic, which happened to be Withered Freddy. Realizing that the animatronic was being hostile, and realizing that he hadn't wound up the music box in a while, he decided to make a break back to his office while Freddy was distracted. Narrowly escaping, he ran back to his office and immediately began to check the cameras and maintain the music box. And a couple hours later, when it was his time to leave, he was attacked by Toy Chica on his way out, which he was able to narrowly avoid by running out of the front door and locking it behind him. 
Night 4 was very different from the rest, immediately beginning in chaos, with multiple animatronics attacking the guard throughout the night, and with all the stress he was being put through, he passed out at 3am. He was then awoken, restrained in a chair in a strange mysterious room, with Toy Bonnie approaching him with a buzzsaw. Toy Bonnie said this to the night guard, he makes us do this. But the night guard began begging for his life, and Bonnie swung the buzzsaw over his head and on top of his arm. Blood immediately started to pour everywhere, and he began to lose consciousness, and before he passed out, the last thing he could heard was the sound of his arm hitting the floor. Awakening again, he couldn't feel his arm, and as he looked over, a metal arm was in place of where his arm used to be. But before he could process it all, Toy Bonnie and Toy Jika began to start the buzzsaw again to take off the other arm. But before they could do that, something knocked down the door. It was Foxy, and Foxy began to attack Toy Bonnie and Toy Chica, disabling them. As Foxy helped the night guard escape, Freddy walked into the room and blocked the exit and proceeded to pick up the buzzsaw that was laying on the floor. The night guard then used his robotic arm to attack Freddy, which worked very effectively. After this, the night guard ran out of the building and went straight to the police station and explained everything. The building was shut down that night, but as paramedics arrived to the scene, they immediately tried to remove the metal arm, but it somehow became infused into the night guard's flesh and wasn't able to be taken out. It's Me is a creepypasta that explains all the events seen in FNAF 2's minigames and explains in depth the events that led up to the bite of 87. The story starts from the perspective of a little kid, leaving the pizzeria because they were terrified of Fredbear, but in the midst of leaving the building, someone driving down the street next to the child pulled up next to them and abducted them. The story then proceeds to talk about how this event impacted the restaurant's reputation and how it was forever tainted after this. But that was until the owners decided to scrap the Spring Bonnie and Fred Trap animatronics in replacement for Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Golden Freddy. After settling to a new location, everyone seemed to enjoy the place, seemingly forgetting about the troubled past of the last pizzeria. But shortly after the opening of the new location, a seemingly familiar car was seen, but no one noticed it because everyone was too preoccupied with a little girl's birthday party. As the party was happening, many of the parents weren't in the room, as they all planned to follow Foxy into the room to surprise the children. As the parents were eagerly waiting for Foxy to come and surprise all the kids, Foxy was finally ready. As the parents and staff followed Foxy towards the party room, they finally arrived, but as they all entered the room, no kids were to be seen except just pools of blood. The story then fast forwards into the future, now taking us to the FNAF 2 pizzeria location. We are given an explanation and are led through the journey it took to get the new pizzeria opened with it being described to us all the changes and quirks that were made to keep the place safe. But due to a minor incident around the restaurant's opening involving one of the day guards being grabbed by Withered Freddy, police were called to make sure everything was okay and that no one was harmed. But as they investigated, they found the corpses of the missing children from that birthday party all of those years ago, and discovering that someone used the spring bonnie suit to unalive them. After figuring this out, the location was set to temporarily close, but they were scheduled to host one last birthday party the next day. So during the party, one of the toy animatronics scared a little kid away from the party area, which led him to run into the same room as the puppet was. One of the day guards took notice of this and followed after him. And as he entered the room, he began asking the child what was wrong. But the guard then started to slowly notice that the music box wasn't playing any music. And as he turned to look at the music box, he began to notice the puppet rising out of it before shortly attacking him. This story is fairly short, so I am going to read it in full. You know, parents are always finding new ways to entertain or enrich their children. In fact, the earliest years are the most important in a child's life when it comes to developing their young mind. This was no different for me. My mom would always take me to the arcades, complete with all sorts of top of the line games, or the parks with the jungle gyms that were always scolding hot from being in the sun all day. There weren't too many options to choose from, but for what they were, those are what made up my fondest childhood memories. As a treat for my seventh birthday, Birthday, my mom took me to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. It was supposed to be a fun little place, from what I can remember, a magical place for kids and grown-ups alike, where fantasy and fun come to life, or something like that. It looked really promising. To be honest with you, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited about going there. The pizza was what you'd expect, lazily put together and didn't quite taste right. But you didn't go over there for the food, you went to see Freddy Fazbear and his gang of colorful friends, Bonnie the Bunny and Chica the Chicken. There was Foxy too, and he lived at Pirate's Cove. Thinking back on it now, the animatronics were pretty good for the time. They had full body movement when singing on stage, and even Foxy moved around quite a bit on his little pirate ship. 
In fact, I remember that after a few songs, Freddy and his friends would come off the stage and walk around interacting with the kids. They would walk up to the kids and say things like, how's the pizza? Or are you having fun? I remember that Foxy always said, it's me, I'm gonna get ya. It was kind of cute. To keep the kids entertained, there would be little games they'd play, like Follow the Freddy, which was just Follow the Leader, or Foxy's Treasure Hunt, where kids would be given small trinkets and Foxy would chase after them like a game of tag. I remember I had finished my slice of pizza and asked if I could play the Treasure Hunt game with Foxy. My mom said it was okay, so I got up and one of the workers gave me a tiny palm-sized treasure chest. I was actually really excited, because Foxy was my favorite. Me and about six other kids were given small treasures, and that's when Foxy jumped off of Pirate's Cove, and he yelled, it's me, I'm gonna get ya. And that's when we all scrambled. It was great fun. I looked over my shoulders and saw Foxy chasing around the other kids, and at one point he almost got me. Boy, Foxy was fast. I didn't quite know why at the time, but while I was in the middle of playing the treasure hunt game, my mom lifted me up abruptly and carried me swiftly towards the exit. She said things like, we've got to go right now, and we should have never have come here. I'd never heard such urgency in her voice before. I thought that maybe it was because some kids started crying when Foxy got him. They had screamed really loudly and started sobbing. I remember that a bunch of parents rushed over. There was all sorts of commotions and noise, but I was too busy having fun to notice that anything was wrong. But now that I think about it, I do remember that as my mom carried me through the exit, I saw Foxy standing above the body of a kid he had caught. He was staring at me with crimson liquid dripping from his teeth. The Bite of 87 is a creepypasta that goes into detail about the events that led up to The Bite of 87, but instead of it taking place in the FNAF 2 pizzeria, it takes place in the FNAF 1 location instead. The story starts with the narrator explaining why a night guard was needed in the location, and exposes to the audience that it wasn't to keep the burglars out, but instead to keep the animatronics in. Explaining that night guards were needed in order to make sure the animatronics weren't damaged or stolen over the nights, as the pizzeria didn't have the money to replace them or to shut them down to fix them. With this information given to us, the narrator begins to explain how during one fateful day in 1987, Foxy began having technical errors and broke down four times in the hour prior, but they kept him up and running in order to not lose profits. During his performance that day, he was still experiencing issues, mainly with his voice box and balance. As he walked around the stage, his legs creaked loudly and he began to act strangely to the children. With many of the kids sitting on the floor in front of the stage, they all listened eagerly to his stories, not noticing him continue to malfunction. But that was until Foxy Foxy let out a groan and froze, losing his balance and falling off of the stage, landing on a child and taking their frontal lobe as he hit the floor. Chaos immediately ensued, and many parents ran over along with staff to get the animatronic off of the child, with some calling 911 and some evacuating the building. The story then goes over to a conversation with the owner and a mechanic, with them arguing about the incident, complaining to each other that they shouldn't have let Foxy perform due to his previous malfunctions and so on. The narrator then begins to explain the aftermath of the situation stating that the Pirate's Cove area was immediately closed and that Foxy wasn't allowed to play shows permanently and that Foxy wasn't allowed to play any more shows except during the night. This story describes the events of a teenager babysitting their baby cousin at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, when things start to go very wrong. The story is very long, but it is very simple to understand, so I will be quickly summarizing it as well. The narrator and his little cousin, Alex, went to Freddy Fazbear's because Alex's parents were busy that day. So they went to Freddy's to watch the band, play the arcade games, and etc. But during one of the various shows played by the band, the narrator noticed that the animatronics were staring directly at him and weren't moving. He started to feel uneasy and began to Panic, so he ran over to a worker to ask what's happening with the animatronics. As he began explaining to the worker what was going on, the animatronics then weren't looking at him as the stage curtain was closed by now. But then Alex ran up to him interrupting his conversation with the worker, asking for his phone to call his mom. So the narrator gave Alex his phone and then Alex ran into the arcade to proceed with the conversation with his mom. As a couple hours passed, it was finally closing. So Alex and him began to get ready to leave, but just as they were heading out, Alex had to use the restroom. As they proceeded to the bathroom, Alex entered and the narrator waited for Alex to use the restroom outside. But minutes passed and he still wasn't done. And by that time, many staff members were already out of the building and he was sure that him and Alex were the only ones left in there. As some more time passed, he checked the bathroom to realize Alex wasn't in there anymore and noticed that his phone was missing as well. The narrator then proceeded towards the front door to leave and get help, but that was until he noticed that there was a metal door blocking his exit. He realized he was trapped in there and he couldn't leave. As the story progresses, some more 
more, the animatronics began to move and started to try and kill the narrator. The story goes in depth, explaining how he was surviving the night while also still trying to find Alex. But some hours later into the night while fighting to survive, the narrator managed to find a crowbar, which he used to break a window and escape. After the narrator contacted the police after escaping, they went inside to investigate, finding out that the animatronics were all back in their original positions and Alex wasn't anywhere to be seen, and they haven't found Alex to this day. This is arguably one of the most unique stories on this list, completely changing the FNAF story and flipping it on its head. Even though some parts of it are fairly odd, if you allow yourself to ignore those strange moments, I'd say this story is very enjoyable. This story explains a fan-made rendition of how Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria came to be, and follows along many key moments in the FNAF story. It begins with a brief summary explaining to the reader how Robert Fosworth was beginning his journey in the restaurant business, naming his first restaurant Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Taking inspiration from other attractions that had animatronics as entertainment, he decided to create his own band of animatronics for his restaurant so that it would appeal to all ages. To make his animatronics the best, he asked his technicians to make the most advanced animatronics with state-of-the-art AI, which was more money than he thought it would originally be. So the company making the animatronics for him mentioned to him that they had an experimental AI that was way cheaper that they could use instead. Robert accepted this deal immediately, and he was too blinded by his vision for the restaurant to see any downsides to this. Robert accepted this deal immediately, as he was too blinded by his vision for the restaurant to see any downsides to this. The technicians have been working on this experimental AI, which involved them testing how the human brain could work with mechanical nerves, and if both could coincide together and have the brain control the endoskeleton of the animatronics. And by doing this, these animatronics now had a free will mode and a normal AI mode, and with the flick of a switch, you could switch between these modes. Months later, these models were finally sent to Robert, and as he began to act them, the animatronics looked at him perplexed. As they looked at their surroundings and body, Bonnie asked, what have you done to me? In a human-like voice. Robert switched on the normal AI mode to avoid this strange behavior and continued setting up the building for opening. Sometime later, the restaurant finally opens to become a success, but shortly after, Robert passes away and gives the restaurant to his son Jeremy. Jeremy had no interest in the restaurant, so he sold it to another company. And shortly after selling it, the place began to get taken care of less and the free roam mode was activated on the animatronics so the staff didn't have to deal with them as much. But due to the neglect of the restaurant, five children were murdered by Freddy Fazbear due to his anger of being put into the suit. But another incident occurred right after this where Foxy also attacked one of the CEOs of the company for the same reasons, which caused the company to sell off the restaurant. Luckily, someone else bought the restaurant right after this, with the new owner changing many things to the restaurant. The new owner only set the animatronics to roam at night, which prompted them to hire night guards so the animatronics wouldn't leave the building. But shortly after, the place was closed due to the former security guard, Mike Schmidt, suing the new owner for his life being endangered. As police investigated, they found all the corpses and remains hidden within the suits. In the aftermath is a story that shows us what really happened in Phone Guy's final call from FNAF 1, giving us an in-depth look of his thoughts while recording the messages for the next security guard, while also explaining what happened after his death and what happened to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in the aftermath of his passing. The story begins with Phone Guy putting in his resignation, but his boss needed him to work one last leak, just so they can find another night guard to take his place after he left. So Phone Guy reluctantly agreed and went in for his final week, starting his shift. As he began his shift, he started to think about his replacement and how he wouldn't know what he'd be getting himself into. So the phone guy eagerly picked up the phone and recorded his first message. The story continues as phone guy records the rest of his messages for the next night guard, making multiple voice recordings explaining various things in depth. But as he is recording these messages, the animatronics are starting to become very aggressive and are trying to get into his office. But that was until phone guy noticed that he was using a lot of his power while recording these messages, which eventually led to him running out of power and getting attacked by the animatronics. The story then switches over to a news broadcast, explaining that one of the animatronics escaped the building during the night, with the news broadcaster going into detail how there was no one to prevent the animatronics from leaving the building because the night card had seemingly quit. The story then moves into the aftermath of the phone guy's death, with it being explained to the reader how Freddy's was due to close because five children were found murdered in the back room, and how it really affected business for the restaurant, with it also being mentioned that the animatronics were continuously breaking down and malfunctioning, which led the manager to officially announce the closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza.
The Bite of 83 is one of the most iconic FNAF moments in the entire franchise, and this story decides to take that event and show the story to us from the perspective of a bystander at the pizzeria. The story begins, narrated by a little kid, going to Fredbear's family diner with their parents. As they enter the building, they can see a young boy crying while underneath a table, clearly terrified to be there. So the narrator went up to the crying child and asked him what was wrong, but he didn't get a response from him at all, so the narrator just went back to his parents. Later on throughout the day, the narrator noticed that 14 teenagers all wearing animatronic masks started teasing the child, but with the narrator being afraid of the teenagers, he didn't bother snitching and telling his parents about the teens, afraid that he would get bullied too for it. But that was when the narrator noticed that the teens were teasing the crying child by putting him closer and closer to Fredbear, until they finally put the crying child's head in the Fredbear's mouth, killing him as the mouth shut on his head. This is where we start to get into some of the more bad creepypastas, with bad writing and etc. But this story is very short, so I'm just gonna read it in full. The year was 1987. Freddy Fazbear's had reopened. I decided to go. I was 12, so the animatronic shows were kind of dumb. Balloon Boy was stupid, Kid Cove was only for little kids, but one area I liked, the puppets area. He gave the prizes, nothing else. His area was not quiet because it had a faint music box in the background that always calmed me down. The only downside was that the puppet was creepy. He had an odd smiling face and never said a word. He only laughed when he gave kids prizes, but back to what I was saying. It was a great place and had delicious pizza and fun games. But sadly, one time I accidentally got locked in the pizzeria. I walked around trying to find a spare key or something to break the door with, and I found a room labeled Parts and Services. I knew old animatronic pieces were in there. They might break a door, so I opened it. It was dark, but luckily I had a flashlight with me. I turned it on, and I found a loose arm on an old Bonnie the Bunny model, so I ripped it off. I had trouble walking back to the exit, and I stumbled into the puppet's area. The music box was playing, and I found a key. I threw the arm behind me, knowing that the key would be easier to use. But the arm fell in the music box, and the music stopped playing. The puppet then rose out of the box. He said, let's play, and ran after me. I was quicker, but just by a bit. So I quickly unlocked the main door, got outside, and locked it up again. So I quickly unlocked the main door, ran outside, and locked up the door again. I ran home, crying. I got back home, haunted by the nightmare that forever stayed in my mind. This story is also not the best, with the video narration of it not being very understandable as well. So due to the story's difficult to understand nature, I'm going to be doing a very quick summary of this story. This creepypasta is about the narrator sneaking into the brand new Fazbear's Fright attraction because why not? As they explored the closed attraction, they stumbled upon a locked room, which they then break into as well. And as they enter the room, they hear a loud thud. As the narrator turned towards the sound, he saw a destroyed animatronic that was twitching on the ground. But as he went to leave it, room, the lights went out and began flickering. And as he was trying to find his way out, he noticed that the animatronic was now blocking the exit to the room. As the lights went dark again, the narrator heard another thud and realized that the animatronic fell onto the ground, presumably running out of power. As he ran for the exit, he tripped over what he thought was a human head. And after seeing this, he passed out, but miraculously woke up outside of the building safe. I mean, that's not the full story, but like, it's kind of the whole premise behind it. It's not, not the best. It doesn't really make too much sense. So, um, that, this is the best I can do. This story takes place immediately after FNAF 6, where William Athen was finally put to rest during the fire that finally killed him. The story is told in an outside perspective, explaining what happened to William afterwards, and it starts with William floating in a black abyss, realizing he was finally dead after all these years. He was joyful, realizing he wasn't actually in hell, but instead a weird limbo-like place. He began laughing hysterically, realizing Henry killed him for nothing, as he wasn't suffering like how Henry hoped he would've after his death. But then a strange light appeared appeared in the abyss, and from the light came a small box which dropped into his hands. He proceeded to open the box, which seemingly teleported him out of the abyss, but into a heavenly-like realm where he could see a man walking on the clouds. William asked if he was God, and the man responded back to him listing off all of his crimes, telling him that he made a special place just for him. William seemingly teleported back into the abyss, where three words appeared in front of him ultimate custom night. But before he could do anything, the words disappeared, and God said that that was actually Michael's personal hell instead, not his. As God apologized, new words appeared in front of Afton, them saying ultimate punishment night. Oh 
This story is rough, but it's quick, so I'ma read it in full as well. My parents were bringing me the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza with David and Joey. When we got there, Golden Freddy was already out on the dance zone. David, Joey, and I ran over immediately because we love Golden Freddy. He was throwing tickets around near the prize counter and said he had more in the back. He went to get them as we collected the remaining ones. When he took a while to come back, the other children went away. But we had just gotten there and he left so soon. So Joey, David, and I went to go find him. We entered one of the rooms and then the door closes. We turn around to see Golden Bonnie. Joey loves Golden Bonnie, so he went in for a hug and he got so excited that after he hugged him, he went into shock and fainted. He must have had ketchup on him because it started pooling around him. But then everything went cold and my mom told me to keep my jacket with me. But then I see David fall over too and the Bonnie picks him up and the lights go off. Then I hear metal clinging together. Now for this layer, most of the stories are fairly short, so I'm just going to be reading every single one of them in full. Plus, some of these you need to read fully in order to even understand them, so let's just get into it. It was only a few days after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 4 when it happened. I was checking scottgames.com, looking for a new teaser image. Sure enough, the image of Plush Trap was still there. Terrible things come in small packages. It hadn't changed. I hit refresh to see if there was a new image. After I pressed the button, the screen went blank. There was nothing on the screen at all. It was like my monitor was asleep. I moved my mouse to try and get it to react, but nothing happened. After what felt like an hour of waiting, I saw something flash on the monitor. Something that looked a bit like Fredbear. I didn't get a good look at it, but immediately following the jump scariest thing was a blue screen. What the hell? I said to myself. I forced the computer to shut down and I restarted it. There were all kinds of 8s and 7s flashing by, almost like someone had hacked my computer. I could have sworn I saw Golden Freddy flash by a few times. I even even heard it's me being spelled out on my speakers. I tried muting the sound but it didn't work, it just made it louder. I tried opening Steam but my screen said you can't for about 2 seconds. Then out of nowhere, all of the icons on my desktop disappeared. Recycling bin gone, FNAF 4 gone, Team Fortress 2 all gone, even the taskbar disappeared, everything went black. 5 minutes later the screen was tinted red, almost like the cat dose from Spooky's house jump scares. There were still hundreds of 8s and 7s flashing by but there was one thing that was different. I didn't hear static anymore. I heard distorted church bells. 12 bells. I looked at the clock just as the bells predicted. It was midnight. I looked at my monitor again. There was a single icon. It said SC877 Games. I was hesitant to click on it because I wasn't sure what would happen. Eventually, I clicked on it because why the hell not? I was nervous. It took a while to load, but then the window went full screen and I saw something absolutely terrifying. It was a close-up of Fredbear's unholy face. I nearly screamed when I saw it, mostly because all I heard in the background was Nightmare's jump scare audio. That played for hours. For a few minutes, I just sat there. I was horrified. Eventually, I asked myself a question. What is going on here? At that point, I didn't think anything could be scarier. Why? Because Fredbear replied to me. You should tell yourself that this is in your head, boy. Fredbear said. What in, I'm sorry, but did you just say something? Indeed I did mortal. I am not real, but not fake. I can hear every word you say. I am living yet unliving. For I am the Fredbear virus you have been infected. Why are you doing this to me? Can't you go find another guy and infect their computer? If only you knew. If only you knew the pain of being alive yet dead, but dead yet alive at the same time. It is painful. This is your nightmare accepted. With that, Fredbear jump scared me. I shut my computer down and went to bed, thinking about what he had said dead yet alive. The next morning, I was afraid to turn on my computer. I was afraid that Fredbear was waiting for me. So I turned my computer on, and I found a red screen. There was all kinds of weird source code, eights and sevens scattered everywhere. Fredbear underscore virus underscore exe repeated multiple times, and a final message that read, you can't escape death, whether it be at the hands of a killer, in the mouth of a beast, or in the comfort of your gurney. Death will find you, you have been warned. This computer will now shut down entirely. After that, my laptop shut down forever. It never reactivated. I tried recharging it, but it was a no-go. There was no going back.
This is your classic EXE creepypasta. Of course I had to put one on this list. So anyways, here it is. FNAF 3 just came out, and I've been a fan of the series ever since the beginning, especially after everyone was making theories about the story. I wanted to play FNAF 3 when it came out, but I never really had the money, so I was looking for the game online, but all I could get was links to buy it. The only links I were finding were for a website called PirateBane that was using a separate program, so I tried installing the program to get the game and it worked for a while. But instead of it being called FNAF 3, it was called Springtrap. I guess it was to make things more sneakier, but I don't know. When I loaded up the game, it only had Springtrap on the menu, and I knew who he was because of all the theories online. But his eyes were staring at me, not the cursor but at me. So I loaded into the game and I was a security guard, but instead of being in the security room, I was at the main door of the place. Text faded onto the screen saying escape, and I heard things fall behind me. I turned around and nothing was there, so I tried opening the door, but it was locked and needed a key. I went into the first room I saw, and it was a closet. There was nothing in there, but as I turned around, Springtrap was standing behind me, staring at me. He then walked away, and I exited the room to check the others, and I couldn't find the key. So I headed back to the main door, and Springtrap was standing there with a key around his neck, and he took it off and gave it to me. As I opened the door to walk out, he said, I always come back, and he pulls me back in and starts tearing me to shreds. Now this story has a very unique idea behind it, but the writing just isn't the best, so let's begin. You probably know a horror game franchise called Five Nights at Freddy's, right? Well, there was rumored to be an unreleased game which was claimed to be the first Five Nights at Freddy's game in the franchise back in 2013. It was believed that Scott wanted to make a real horror game, unlike the other ones, and like the other horror games like Slender, Amnesia, and Outlast, but then realized what mistake he made and stopped. The time I found the download and played it was in December 13, 2014, while I was messing around with inspect elements in Scott's website. I decided to type in scottgames.com slash offline exe for some random reason. But when I pressed enter, a download appeared titled Five Nights at Freddy's Zeros. I was confused by why Scott would add a download in such a random link, but I was pretty proud of myself for being the first to discover it. When I clicked on it, it took me to a menu which was the same menu as Five Nights at Freddy's 1, but the V031 was gone and the Scott Cawthon 2014 in the title were replaced with Scott Cawthon 2013 and Five Nights at Freddy's zero. I hit new game. It didn't take me to an intro with the newspaper saying that Freddy Fazbear's Pizza needed a new night guard. In fact, it just skipped straight to the game. The security office didn't look very interesting, a gray blank wall with no posters, and a hallway in the middle. And a table with a puppet plushie which seemed withered and had a cracked mask with blood running from his eye holes and organs bursting from the chest. Then there was a phone call. Uh, hello? Hello? Well, if you're hearing this, your chances are death will come for you. You made a poor career choice. Death will come for you? What kind of employee would say that? I decided to open the camera. I realized that there was only two cameras, Cam 8 and Cam Negative 6. I flipped the Cam 8 to find that Golden Freddy was standing in what appeared to be a child's bedroom with a realistic baby in a crib behind him crying. The strange thing about Golden Freddy is that the jaw was missing and he had bloodshot eyes. I switched to cam negative 6, which had no signal. I checked the hall light to find Golden Freddy, again but with no jaw, but now with blank soulless eyes. I tried to close the door, finding out that the door button wouldn't work as it looked like blood was spilled on it. Of course it wouldn't work. Why would a door button covered in blood work anyways? I checked the hall light once more to see if Golden Freddy was gone. When I checked it, it went black for a second and then went back to normal. Except the door was absent and that the puppet's tears and lipstick were gone and they were washed off. This is how the story was written guys. I know it's a little confusing, but I'm reading it as it was written. I checked the cameras again. This time there was a new camera, Cam Zero. I checked Cam Zero, finding that it was a non 8-bit recreation ending of FNAF 3, where Purple Man gets killed inside a spring trap, but not 3D rendered. In fact, it looked like as if it happened in real life. In fact, the ghosts of the five children looked like they were burned alive. That was when I heard a scream. In fact, it sounded very realistic. I jumped out of my seat. I scrambled to get back on my feet and checked Cam 8. When I checked it, something was different. The baby that was in the crib was absent and Golden Freddy was soaked in blood. Blood drained from my face and was refilled with dread. A dread that Golden Freddy would look at me. So I quickly switched to Cam negative 6. When I saw Cam negative 6, I was horrified. What I saw was a picture of a child inside an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's pizza lying down with the same details as the puppet plushie in the office, cracked open head, bleeding eye sockets, and organs bursting from the chest, but unlike the puppet plushie, other organs were spilling out of the mouth. That was a full sentence by the way. And behind him were two legs with purple pants on that were covered in blood, possibly the purple man. I almost vomited at this point, so I closed down the monitor, only triggering Golden Freddy's jump scare. Not the same one Golden Freddy would use in this version, 
Golden Freddy actually had teeth, showing like the poster of Golden Freddy you would see very rarely, including the slowed down version of the screen for one second until my computer crashed and went blue screen. At that point, what I saw from the corner of my eye, what looked like a bloody jawless Golden Freddy. I quickly looked at where he was standing, but I saw nothing. I looked back at my computer screen, which was still the BSOD. I tried restarting, but I got the same blue screen, meaning I had to reboot my computer. This time it booted up as normal. That's when I got to the Windows 7 startup sound. In the middle of that, the same Golden Freddy jump scare appeared. But unlike the other one, it didn't cause my computer to go blue screen. In fact, it stayed even after the screen. I tried shutting down my computer by holding down the power button, but it didn't work. I waited for it to end. It stayed for two minutes, then it finally went to desktop. This time, there was a notepad on my desktop. It had no name. I opened it only to find it said, can you guess who I am. Blood drained from my face. I deleted the text file and emptied my recycle bin. Last night, I was about to enter my bedroom. I saw the same figure running through the hallway. Yeah, that story was a... Uh, ooh, that story hurt the read. That one, uh, that one, uh, that one was, uh, that one was, that one was, that one was bad. <laughs> bad, bad, bad story. Not hating, not hating. Not hating. It was probably a young child who, uh, who wrote it, but that one was, uh, that one was a mess to read. Anyways, let's get to the next one. We're finally onto the last entry of this iceberg, so I hope you guys are excited. Now, this one has an interesting backstory behind it. As I was researching for this video, I stumbled upon a forum post on some miscellaneous website which I can't remember the name. There was a story on it talking about the FNAF themed haunted house attraction in Las Vegas called the Fright Dome, where the user explained a strange incident that occurred to him when he visited the attraction. The user began his story by explaining his love for FNAF, and how during opening weekend for the attraction, him and a group of friends went to it. The user proceeded to go on a side tangent, explaining that during the opening weekend, Scott Cawthon was actually at the attraction and would take pictures with fans at the end of the attraction near the exit, which is why he wanted to go so badly. As him and his friends arrived to the attraction, the user described it as being packed and the lines were insanely long, but after around an hour of waiting, they were finally inside. As they walked through the haunted house, the user explained how he began to have a bad gut feeling, not from being scared or anything, but from what he described as an overwhelming feeling of dread. He shook it off and just assumed it was from him being scared. But eventually, they all finished the haunted house and entered the final room, where Scott Cawthon was taking pictures with fans. The user described the room as a lobby-like room, where you could buy merchandise from the attraction and wait for your friends if they got separated or were put in separate groups. The user was ecstatic to meet Scott, but his friends weren't. So his friends left the haunted house to go get food at a nearby restaurant. So the user told his friends to go to the restaurant without him and that he would meet them there, because there was yet again a long line to take pictures with Scott. He entered the line and went to go on his phone to pass some time and to get his camera ready when he realized his phone was dead and his friends already left so he couldn't use their phones or contact him to come back. He wanted to run outside to go get them but once you left the haunted house you couldn't come back in unless you bought another ticket to go through the whole haunted house again. So he decided to just wait in line and hopefully get something along the lines of an autograph from Scott. As the user finally got in front of the line and was face to face with Scott he asked him if he can get his autograph instead since his phone had died. Scott agreed and reached for a backpack on the ground, which the user assumed was Scott's. As Scott dug through the backpack, he could see what looked like to be snacks, notebooks, and some other necessities for the long night of pictures Scott had ahead of him. But that was until a young child ran up to Scott, causing him to drop his backpack. Security escorted the kid to the back of the line, and the user proceeded to help Scott pick up the stuff that fell out of his backpack. Scott thanked him, and still distracted by what just happened, Scott nonchalantly grabbed one of the various notebooks he had, and ripped a piece of paper out and signed it for the user. Scott said thank you to the user, and told him to have a safe night. The user thanked Scott as well, and began to walk out of the attraction, and he looked back to give Scott one last look, but as he did, Scott was staring at his notebook confused, like he just accidentally did something he wasn't supposed to. But the user was already out of the building and began heading to the restaurant his friends were at. The story then gets weird here, as the user then fast forwards the story a bit to when he got back home. As he got home, he wanted to take a clear look at the autograph, and he noticed that the notebook page had writing on the back of it. The user thought that Scott must have ripped out a page from the wrong notebook, but the user was so eager to see if there was any concepts for a new FNAF game on the back of the paper, he turned the page, but was shocked to see that everything was written backwards and was written in a dark red ink. So the user put his phone on the charger 
and turned it on to take an image of the paper. And when he did, he flipped the image so the handwriting was no longer backwards. The writing was described to be Latin, and when translated, the user explained how the writing seemed to be a continuation from a previous page of the notebook, with the page seemingly talking about the devil, with some sentences being written in a completely different handwriting style, almost like it was two people taking turns writing the sentences. The user was able to tell which handwriting was Scott's from the autograph, but the other handwriting was so messy it almost looked scribbled on. The user then asked people in the forum how to contact Scott so he could give the paper back to him, but no one responded back to the user at all. As I went to look for the story, I couldn't find it, so I decided to share it here in this video for you guys. So maybe you guys could help me find the truth behind what the page meant and why Scott had it. Anyways, that's the end of the FNAF Creepypasta Iceberg. I hope you enjoyed it, and maybe I'll make a part two in the future. If you loved this iceberg, you'll love the ultimate FNAF hoax and rumor iceberg video that you can watch here. I know some stories didn't make too much sense, but I tried to read them off as best as I could and get all the juicy information in for all my summarizations. 